Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to study your word. Help, help your word inspire us and teach us what you would like us to know about our faith and also about how you care for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. <coughs> now, uh, all of you uh, graduated from high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want you to listen to, before we begin, this is, this is a little, little bit of levity here. Listen to what it took. This is the examination for admission to the Jersey City High School in June 1885. Now this is to get into high school. Now you're not even going to freshman yet. Under algebra, find the prime factors of x4 minus b4 and x to the third minus 1. Uh, under arithmetic, this is this goes right up Dave's alley. The mason work on a building can be finished by 16 men in 24 days, working 10 hours a day. How long will it take 22 men working 8 hours a day to finish the work? <coughs> this, 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 this is eighth grade stuff here, you know. Uh, geography. What is the axis of the Earth? What is the equator? What is the distance from the equator to either pole in degrees or in miles? Why is it warmer at the equator than near the poles? Well, okay. uh, name four principal ranges of mountains in Asia, three in Europe, and three in Africa. And this is eighth graders? Yes, eighth graders. <coughs> uh, name ten countries in South America and the capital of each. I would have thought. Now, you all know how to speak English, right? Yeah. Write a sentence containing a noun used as an attribute, a verb in the perfect tense potential mood, and a proper adjective. Yeah, what, 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 I don't even know what an attribute is. <laughs> I don't either. I know what a verb and a noun, that's about it. Adjective. An attribute? Would an attribute be like, uh, you're very good at numbers. Attributes or attributes? Anyway, it's... I don't know. So, uh, mm -hmm. under U.S. history, name four Spanish explorers and state what induced them to come to America. <laughs> crazy, uh, crazy. What caused the Mexican War? What was the result? What American general commanded the capture of the city of Mexico? Mm -hmm. huh? Sam Houston. Sam Houston. Um, I love this one. What was the remote and immediate immediate cause of the Great Civil War? Slavery. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, mostly. That was mostly. It was about economics. Yeah, well, anyway, you've got to be brief and concise. Money. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> who captured Fort Donaldson? Uh, the reason this was printed there is because they had just done a study uh, assessing 17-year-old juniors, high school juniors, and asked this question, when did World War I occur? When did it occur? 1918 or something like that. A little more than 40% could not place the event somewhere between 1900 and 1950. But they don't teach anything anymore. Yeah, well, apparently. But I'm just saying that this... This was what eighth graders had to I mean, know. They, they really, these kids are going to be really dumb adults. Yeah. Well, anyway, just remember they're going to be. They're going to. Dumb, be, dumber adults than we are. Let's put it that way. Uh, they're going to be the future of this country, you know. Yeah, I know. They're That's, going to be electing. Whenever my wife watches one of those judge shows that has all of these crazy people that are suing each other, yeah. I, said, I keep telling her, just, I said, just remember, these people are eligible to vote for the President of the United States. Yeah, anyway, uh, <laughs> from last week, uh, uh, we, we began to find that there was some, uh, each uh, of the authors we're looking at in, uh, was looking at the events around the Holy Week a little bit differently. So for the que so first question from last week was who is John writing his book for? Gentiles. Correct. He was writing his book for the Gentiles. And now, now compare that to Matthew. Now remember, John and Matthew were the two that were basically there. So who is Matthew writing his book for? The Jewish people. For the Jewish people. So now keep this in mind as we go through. Uh, 
uh, what we have for this week. Let's start by looking at John chapter 18. Uh, this is when uh, Jesus appears before uh, Pilate, who I must tell you is <coughs> someone who... Uh, let's, let, how do I want to say this? It's someone who did not want to be involved in this thing at all. So uh, who, who, he would have referred somebody else to do it. And, well, he would. He he didn't yeah. want to be involved. Period. Yeah, you know? he was put right in the middle. Yeah. yeah, he was right in the middle. So uh, when we read this, keep that in mind. Who who'd like to read verses uh, John eighteen verses twenty eight to thirty eight? I can read it. <laughs> then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness. The Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. But this went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Okay. So, what did we just learn? What does Pilate think? He, Pilate thinks they're wasting his time, is what he thinks. The Jews can't execute anybody, and Pilate doesn't think he should be executed either. So, so he, now, notice how John puts it about why they didn't go into the palace. And during the Passover, they were not allowed to ever enter any structure that was inhabited by Gentiles. So as a result, they waited outside. Now, if they're waiting outside, uh, my suspicion is, well, well, put it this way. If they're waiting outside, how do you think they, uh, John knew what the heck Pilate asked him? Exactly. John either was in there or he was close enough to hear the whole thing. Um, so keep that in mind here. John is, is filling in all of the blanks as we're going along. So now we know that uh, Jesus and Pilate were basically alone. And Pilate is trying to figure out what the heck is going on here and why are you bothering me? Uh, you have to understand that Pilate did not live in Jerusalem. That was not his place of residence. It was somewhere else. But because of Passover, there is a, uh, next to the temple, there is a Praetorian guard headquarters. Mm -hmm. And he comes there just to make sure that, you know, riots don't break out in the streets and all that other stuff. So he just happened to be home for this at the time. Now, let's compare that to Matthew uh, 27, verses 11 to 14. Well, before that, before... Wouldn't Pilate have had an opportunity to charge him right there when he said, you are right in saying I am king? Yeah, he would have. But uh, he chose not to. Now, this is, where it gets, this is where it gets confusing. But you're right. If uh, Pilate could have said, There's, you know, hey, wait a minute, there's no king but Caesar. So why do you think John is telling you what happened? Because 
because of the Jesus had said? Or what, what well, because Pilate didn't consider him a king at all. Because <laughs> uh, if he had, you know, he would have done something. Now, so his, as far as Pilate was concerned, this guy's a nobody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's no threat to me. Okay, so let's look at uh, Matthew 27, verses 11 to 14. Okay. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priest and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. A little difference, huh? John says that they had quite a conversation going on. Uh, Matthew says, well, I'm not so sure. Well, remember, Matthew probably was not inside. But John was. So keep that in mind as, you, as it goes along. But notice... Matthew includes the part about King of the Jews. Okay? He included that part, just the same way John included that part. Uh, so there, there is no doubt that, Je that uh, Jesus said, I am the King of the Jews. Now, Matthew doesn't mention anything else. Remember what John said about Jesus saying about the kingdom? Right. Exactly. Which fits in the day what you asked. He's not, I'm not the king of this world. So he can fit his I'm not going to worry about this guy. You know. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Now, let's turn to Luke chapter 23. Now, remember, Luke was not one of the disciples. Luke was, you know, comes onto the scene when he travels with Paul. So he's writing much later than the others are. So let's look at uh, uh, Luke chapter uh, 23, verses 1 to 12. Here's another little piece to, to add to this. Then the whole assembly rose and let him off the fire. And they began to accuse him by saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes the kingdom of that. Caesar and claim to be Christ the King. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the King of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And Pilate announced to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted and they stirred up the people all over Judea by teaching. He started with a death in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased to be because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the teachers of the law were standing there, confirmatively accusing him, and Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends because they had been because they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, "He brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion." I examined him in your presence and have found no cases of your charges against him. Neither has Peter, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. Okay. Right there. There we go. Now, Herod enters the picture. So, 
you have to ask yourself, why did Luke include that other story? Look at it this way. Now, who does the whole fate of Jesus fall on? Well, Herod said, oh, just get out of here. So who does it fall on? Yeah, well, it falls on Pilate now. Yeah, because, you know, he says, I sent him to Herod. Herod, uh, send him back. So now, all three Gospels, all the Gospels are agreeing that it's, it's, on, it's in Pilate's hands. Okay? And you have to realize that when he said... Herod was in Jerusalem at the time. Herod's palace was way the heck, almost in Syria. So again, it just so happened that Herod was in town for the festival of the Passover. He was not Jewish. I think he was half Jewish. But he figured, you know, I want the people to like me, so I might as well be here. So Keep in mind, now, they're building the story, and it's all in Herod's hands. Now, notice the, uh, it says that the other uh, elders and priests were there in Herod's palace, yelling and screaming at him, and Herod said, no, I don't see any problem with this guy. So he's, I'm out of this. <laughs> Yeah, I have nothing to do with this. If, the, if anything goes bad, he's not me. Still like me, folks. Uh, you have to realize, too, that you know Herod uh, and his family were not the most liked people in the world. Uh, if you recall when Herod, uh, the Herod that built the temple died, he gave it to his two sons, and one was totally incompetent. This is the same one that I said, this is the son of Herod. I believe so, yes. There was Herod Antipas and the, I forget what the other son's name was. Uh, but what they did is they split Herod's old territory in half. So that's why being a Galilean mattered, because that was the northern territory that you know Herod Antipas was the king of. Otherwise, I forget what the, what the other son's name was, but he was so lousy that Rome had to take over for him, because he, he, he lost control of it. But anyway, so Herod spent his whole life trying to get the people to like him. So by not acting here, he's saying, well, gee whiz, now everybody's going to like me. And uh, we'll see if that's the case. Who was in, next um, in line um, in chain of command above Herod? Caesar? Yeah. See, you know, Caesar, let, Caesar would let you govern as long as you behaved yourself. The minute you step one foot out of line, uh, he would take over. Just like I said, in the southern kingdom, that's exactly what he did. Uh, and then he, I guess he used to call these guys in like once a year to find out how things were going and stuff. Remember, Pilate was the, was the military governor. He was in charge of all of the troops in the area. He wasn't exactly the uh, king, if you will. But so, what... Luke is trying to show you, and what the other Gospels are trying to say, is that uh, Pilate saw nothing wrong, Herod saw nothing wrong, but the people are still that were there are still irate and still want something to happen. Remember, uh, Dave read, he said, "I will," you know, Pilate said, "I will punish him and then release him." Okay. Why did he punish him? It's, it's like, well, it's like anything else. Well, uh, maybe if I punish them, they'll leave me alone. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, it, it, that, was their, that was his reasoning. Uh, because in those days, they didn't have much in the way of jails. Basically, they, you know, they, if, you, if you were naughty, they beat the heck out of you and let you go. Uh, you know, prisons were not uh, a thing until... Uh, until the United States back in the 1800s, uh, because, like I said, look at look at in England. They, if you if you did something wrong, what they do? They put you in the stocks for three days. What about the gladiators? Yeah. Uh, during that time. Yeah. Uh, they prisoners. The gladiators. Yeah. Well, they they were prisoners. But what I'm saying is, the idea of going to prison for committing a crime 
uh, was not th that well, you know, there weren't, there weren't any buildings like the Bastille running around. So uh, basically what they did is they, they whipped you or they, uh, or they uh, beat you or they did this or they did that. And they let you go saying, don't do it again. And if we do it, you do it again, we'll just kill you. Uh, and so that was their lead reasoning. You know, Jesus said, you brought him to me, I punished him, as far as I'm concerned, he's, you know, my, I'm done. So you've got, you've got, all the Gospels are agreeing that Jesus said, I am the king of the Jews, but only one of them said, went on to explain what he meant. Okay, and this, this is kind of uh, important. <laughs> So, let's look at John uh, 19, 14 to 16. Now, this is where the story gets, uh, this is where the story gets uh, more interesting. Here, you know, because remember, everything has gone on. Uh, all the people were there yelling and screaming, and Pilate's trying to get this thing out of his, out of his uh, control, and he can't do it. So, I'll read these two. Are you doing John 18? No, John 19. Because 18 is versus Barabbas on the paper. See what I'm talking about? Okay, well, far. yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going too far ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's go to 1838B. It starts uh, in a new section uh, to 40. Now, remember what pile, I, 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 I've got out of line here. Remember, Pilate has run, out of, has run out of logic. So what he's going to do is he's going to say, hey, here's this bum that you guys you know, gave to me that was tearing up everything, and he was a real nasty guy and everything, or I'll give you Jesus. Now you pick which one you want. So would somebody read John 18, 38, 40? All right. by finding a basis for the charge against him. Mm -hmm. But it was your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the castle. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. It was Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in the rebellion. So, they wanted Barabbas. Barabbas was, they don't know much about him other than he was a rabble-rousing revolutionary who didn't really care much about the faith. He just cared about, you know, making noise and uh, just being an irritant, which the Romans did not take kindly to. Now, compare that to Matthew 27, 15 to 21. I tried to find out something about this Barabbas. Guy, but they said all they know is that who his father was and everything. They don't know anything else about him. Yeah, of course. You know, in the in the movies, it kind of seems like the way they portrayed him is like he was doing what the people had hoped he was doing. As far as mm -hmm. uh, trying to, I say, the way. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, uh, Barabbas, I, I, uh, do you remember Pancho Villa? Pancho Villa claimed he was trying to, be, you know, he was trying to get Mexico uh, under a new government. Or anything. So he crosses over the border into, into uh, New Mexico and shoots a bunch of people and does all that. Now, uh, the fact is, I don't think I don't know what he was thinking because as soon as you did that, all of a sudden now the United States is chasing him. Well, that's what Barabbas was. He was just kind of a uh, uh, he he was kind of a bull in a china shop, and he got caught. So now let's look at Matthew 15 to 20, uh, 27, 15 to 21, and I'll read that one. Uh, so that way. Uh, Now, it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. 
that they, at the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over to him. So, uh, then when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, now here's, here's another, listen, pay, pay attention. His wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with the innocent, that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas which, to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, they answered. Uh, so basically he's saying, right there, now notice the uh, note about Pilate's wife. Do we know what her dream was? No. It's just that she's saying, hey, I, I, I'm getting a little leery about this. Uh, you get this guy out of my, get this guy out of our control here. Do something. So now she wants him out of there. So here's Pilate trying to figure out, you know, uh, no matter what I do, these people will not leave me alone. And if these people don't leave me alone, they may take their, you know, take their stuff to the streets. I have to quell it. Caesar finds out about it. I'm already don't want this job, and they're going. He's going to give me a job that's worse than the one I already have. So this is where, uh, this is where it, it, it comes to a crescendo. So uh, again, Matthew is trying to say here that look, folks. Uh, Pilate really didn't want anything to do with it, and he adds that piece about Pilate's wife. Now, who is Matthew writing for? The Jews. So, what do you think is going? What do you think Matthew is trying to point out here to the Jews? <clears throat> Remember, Pilate doesn't want anything to do with it. Pilate's wife doesn't want anything to do with it. Who wants something to do with it? Who, want, who wants Jesus executed? The Jewish people. The, 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 the priests and everybody else who were there. So he's, he's painting this picture. Look, folks, it's on you. Okay? It's on you. These two people had nothing, wanted nothing to do with it. It's on you. And that's where we get to uh, John 19, 14 to 16. So let's go back there. And notice there's only two verses for this. Uh, so who wants to read the two? Okay, I can read it. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So, simple. Notice what the, pre what the priest said. We have no king but Caesar. <clears throat> they must have had a vendetta to say that. Because we all know that they didn't actually believe that. Of course not. They 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 believe that uh, you know Caesar was getting in our way. They wanted to get rid of Jesus because he had more followers and, and people liked him and that they had they were losing their power and all their you know, exactly yeah, yeah. They, they were losing all their status and their power and everything so they don't like that so they wanted him out of the picture you know what I mean? right so so when you want that what do you say? Anything that you could think of that will get right. your point across. Which is exactly how uh, John is writing this. He's just saying, look, you know, it's on you, folks. Yeah. Now, here's where it gets uh, more fun. Uh, go to Matthew 27, verses 22 to 26, and we're going to pay specific attention 
to verse 25, because that's the crux of the matter. So let's, let's have somebody read from 22 to 26. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was, was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. Keep going. Yeah. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Look at verse 25. What does its, the people say? Let his blood be on us. Aha! Not a pilot. We accept that responsibility. Okay. At one point, they were saying that the Jews could not kill somebody. Right. Is that just during Passover? No, that's any time. So, so what, what Pilate just says, okay, he's yours now. Go, go ahead and do the deed. But the, but the uh, notice Matthew puts in there that the group of Jewish people there said, let this, his blood be on us and our children. Matthew's writing for the Jews. That is a powerful, powerful, powerful statement. In other words, he's saying they admitted guilt right then and there. And uh, notice about washing his hands. You've heard the term, wash your hands of the whole thing. Yeah. That's where it comes from. Because that's exactly what Pilate did. He washed his hands of the whole thing. He said, I, no, I, you know, if you, that's what you want, go ahead and do it. I won't stop you. And uh, that's, you know, so what Matthew has just done is he has just said, look, from this time forward, you, the one I'm writing to, are responsible. So now what you need to do is repent of your sins and, you know, become uh, part of the faith. Or else. Now, I, I don't know what Matthew figured the or else was, but uh, that's what he just said. So then, uh, now notice... Uh, Notice at the end of 26, he, it said, after he sentenced him, he had Jesus blocked. Right? That's, that's what verse uh, 26 says. He released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed them over to be crucified. So there's a lot, you know, everybody admits that Jesus got, was beaten. Just the, where the timeline it happened, I guess, is what matters. So then on uh, John 19, 1 to 3, uh, this is, uh, uh, Dave asked the question, why, why would they do this? Well, let's see. He said, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up in him again and again, saying, Hail the king of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Now, if you look at verse 4, and once more Pilate came out and said, Look, I'm bringing out to you to let you know that I... So, there's a little discrepancy here as to where in the timeline Jesus gets flogged. But, in answer to Dave's question, that's what Pilate was thinking. <coughs> if I beat the guy up enough, and I make him look bad enough, and bring him out there, maybe they'll say, Okay, you've done enough. They didn't say that. Now, in Matthew, like I said, Matthew 27, 31, and I'll read that one too because it's short. But basically, uh, <coughs> then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. 
They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt it in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took him staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. So, we now know that Jesus had a, had a, had a purple robe we, on him for a while. We now know that he had the crown of thorns. We now know that all the um, soldiers had uh, uh, mocked him and done all of that. So uh, those two Gospels agree. Jesus, you know, you know, when you stop and look at the timeline, this is the important point. It's Thursday night, okay? He gets arrested, goes before the Sanhedrin. Then on Friday, he goes before Pilate. He gets flogged. He gets this, goes back before Pilate. Da -da 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 -da. You talk you talk about a you know a, a, you know quick lynching. We're talking we're not even 24 hours that all of this took place. Now think about in our society, Dave, how long it takes to do that. <laughs> no. yeah. uh, so uh, you know, but, but, the, but the point of the matter is even even just to get the guy in jail would have taken you know takes months. Whereas all of this occurred in like lightning speed. Yeah, but isn't that the way they did things back then anyway, though? Pretty much. Yeah, but in order to have all of these people in the right line, uh, there had to have been some divine intervention here. Because concerned about Saturday too. Yeah, well, that's true. But what I'm saying is the fact that Pilate was there, mm -hmm. the fact that Herod was there, mm -hmm. that they, you know, it was the right day at the right time. All of them were in the right place. Um, it just. You know, it's like uh, in, uh, John said it twice from what we read today. It was so that the words of the scripture would be fulfilled. So in order for all that to happen, there had to have been some divine intervention there. God had to be involved. Because, uh, you know, I mean, what's the odds of you finding a judge? <laughs> you give a day. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Uh, you now, the cards played a big part. Exactly. Except, except he released them to do whatever, you know. The, there was, a, you know, when it come to crucifying somebody, they had a, they had a special group of guards that knew exactly what to do, and they said, hey, you know, take care of this, because you know, crucifixion in the Roman world was pretty common stuff. Uh, I mean, this was not something that happened once in a while. They, they, you remember the movie Spartacus? They had all these guys lined up along the road. Uh, that's what they did. Uh, remember, I told you, there's no prisons. They just, you know, if you, if you want to get rid of somebody, that's how you do it. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's the way they did it. And so it's like this, this team knew exactly how to crucify somebody. And remember, there were two other people involved. And the next time we uh, get together, it's, it, you're going to see how uh, John viewed the other two people and how Matthew viewed the other two people and why the other two people play such an important role in the whole story for us. I mean, that's, that's, that's something that you have to realize, that uh, he wasn't the only one there. There were two other people who by their own admission, deserve what they got. And how the three of them interact, I mean, you're, you're up in the air like that. And, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, you've got to turn, at least take a look at one another. Also keep in mind that there is, uh, under, under normal crucifixion, you broke the legs of the people. Did you know that? You broke the legs of the people. And uh, we're going to find that uh, there was a little difference of opinion on that one, too. But the, the whole idea of um, crucifixion.
crucifixion. In the Roman world, that was like, uh, you know, you, you mess with us, this is what happens to you. And they, they were not afraid to use it. Uh, like, I, like I said, the best way to look at it is when they would lynch somebody in, in, in the South and the West. You know, a group would just come, hang you, and then you're done. You know, it's, uh, you know, why waste time with, with a trial? You know, we know you're guilty. And that's the kind of mob that you had, you know, on that, on that day. And now, what, what's even more amazing is how um, you have to think. Jesus, that Sunday, just four days before, rode into town as the conquering hero. Mm -hmm. And within a week, he goes through all of this. Now, that shows you the power that the... Uh, that all the priests and whatnot had. Also, you have to realize that uh, the population of Jerusalem at this time of the year more than doubled. So there was people all over the place. And Pilate had to be very, very careful. If a, gr if a crowd that size ever got incited, did he have enough soldiers around to put down the rebellion? Do you, do you feel that the majority of the Jews, individual Jews, accepted what the priests were saying? Uh, they were more afraid of what would happen if they didn't. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, they were more afraid of what would happen if they didn't. Mm -hmm. Remember, John pointed out, they would not go into, into Pilate's house. Because if they had gone into Pilate's house and, and, and then participated in the Passover, that, that gave a blank check to everybody else, too. Uh, remember, they were, uh, uh, it was like the Catholic faith for years. If you didn't behave yourself, you were excommunicated. Well, the Jews had a similar thing. You could get kicked out. And if you were kicked out, they believed that you were going to die miserably and all that kind of thing. So the best thing they could do was just go along with it, so they, you know, they'd stay in the good graces. Um, now the the average Jewish person probably didn't even know what, who Jesus actually was. No, that was kind of my point. Uh, keep in mind that all of his ministry was up north around Galilee. Uh, this may have been the only time he ever went. You know, he uh, he, only, he only went to Jerusalem like two or three times, and then he never even went into the city. He went to visit his friends outside. So this was the only time that anybody remembers that he was actually in the city itself. And the Jewish people were not exactly free either. I mean, they weren't free just to go anywhere or form their own state. No, they weren't. And the uh, remember the rules <laughs> involving Passover. Every Jewish male who lived within 25 miles of Jerusalem was, a, was required to be in the city. Required, not maybe. Yeah. Every one of them. And uh, so that's why the population was, was so big. Also, there was, I forget how many priests there actually were, but it's not a dozen. It's in the hundreds. And what would happen is each uh, remember the temple that has that interior area? They would have a new priest come in every day and do the vigil around that. So Zechariah, who was the, who was the uh, uh, father of John the Baptist, <coughs> was one of those priests originally. So you, when you talk about the chief priests and the scribes, you're not talking about 25 or 30 people. You're talking about a big crowd. And so between them and all the other people they could gather, you're probably talking in the hundreds of people just you know, yelling and screaming and making noise and doing all of that. Pilate could not afford to let that get out of hand. Could not afford. That was, you know, because from what we know, he didn't want that job in the first place. All his friends are running around conquering the world and everything. And he's being a policeman in this backwater place in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing but desert rocks. And so he didn't want to screw up. Because he knew if he screwed up that Caesar would find some more miserable place to send him. Uh, 
right? Because that's how that's what that's how you dealt with those kinds of things. So hopefully you can understand that now. Now the, the, all, both of the gospel writers who were there have made it quite clear that Jesus declared that he was king of the Jews. Uh, he was not a king of this world, and that Pilate really didn't want anything at all to do with this whole scenario. And the only reason he agreed to it was to get everybody else to shut up. Okay? Now, next week it's going to, we're going to find that, uh, as I said, there are different uh, interpretations as to what went on. I know I watched the, uh, uh, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. You ever see the other one? The one that was done in Hebrew. It was, uh, was some years ago. Uh, and uh, they made a big deal about that. You know, about, you know, and then I asked them, you know, how did, and then a lot of people came back and said, well, we, you know, they, they were questioning as to how accurate it was. And they said, well, look, you know, it was based on books of two of the people who were there. I mean, how much more accurate could you possibly make? Okay. All right.